Hello to everybody out there in Periscope land. This is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope, and we are on a Romans Overview Part 30. Uh, we actually hit the big three zero. Um, well, I never thought we'd get here, but uh, we are still in Romans 7, and we're going to keep traveling on. So with that being said, guys, let's go ahead and dive into this thing because I was uh, in the middle of this uh, on this last scope and I was just about to make some points on my highlights here. Now, if you guys look, I went over the eyes and the all the eyes. See where I got it highlighted in yellow? All the eyes, me's and me's. And I actually sung some of that for you so you could be blessed by my wonderful singing. Um but you can see, um, whenever you're dealing with this body of flesh, it's a body of death. We are in the law of sin, which is in our members. Look at this. When we're dealing with the body of flesh, it's sin that dwelleth in me. Look at this. Look, it's evil present with me. That's what the body of flesh is. Now, look at this. He says it again. Sin that dwelleth in me. Look, this body of flesh is dealing with soul under sin. Look, guys, that's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with this body of flesh. That's the context. This body of flesh, and it's all about I, 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 me, 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 my, 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 I, me, my. It's, it's all about you. It's sin. That's, look, the middle word, the middle letter in sin is I. It's not the devil. The devil isn't the letter in the middle of sin. It's I. I is the middle letter. Okay? Sin. And we are all sold under sin according to this body of flesh. Now, if you're not saved, you need to get saved and trust in Jesus Christ. But friend, if you're saved already, your body's still sold under sin. And you've got a carnal body. What you need to do is you need to control that thing with your spirit. Okay? So... Let's go ahead and hit some, some factors here of what I was going to deal with in Romans 7, 17. Now watch this. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So there's sin that dwells in me. There's sin that dwells in you. And if any saved person out there, whether they're a pastor, whether no matter what they call themselves, they have sin dwelling in them. And the minute they say they don't have any sin and they're teaching or preaching, you better run away from that person because they don't know the Bible. Guys, if somebody like me, who's not even a pastor and can show you in the Bible that you're a sinner and sin's dwelling in you after you're saved and you're not being taught that by somebody teaching you, you better run the opposite direction to somebody that does know the Bible, okay? That's what you need to do. All right, so with that being said, now that we know that sin dwells in every believer, yes, even the spiritual ones, <laughs> let's, let's go ahead and make, make some claims here. Man has a sin nature. Now, that is a dangerous phrase. Because when you say a sin nature, you better know what you're talking about. Because the Calvinists define sin nature. You know, the Pentecostals define a different kind of sin nature. The, the Catholics define a different kind of sin nature. And then when you get into Bible believers who be actually believe the King James Bible, we define the sin nature differently. <laughs> okay. Man has a sin nature. Now, that would be death by sin. That's the sin nature. All human beings die. All human beings have a body of flesh. Now, let's talk a little bit about maybe some of the desires of the flesh, which the desires of the flesh don't make you do anything. You have complete and utter control over your flesh when you're saved or when you're lost. The difference is when you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit to help you, not to make you do anything. <laughs> All right, guys, let's do this. Uh, man has a sin nature, so death by sin, and a propensity towards sinning. Now, don't mix that up. I didn't say that, you know, there's nothing in you that makes you sin. You have a propensity towards sin because of the desires of the flesh. You can choose to um, not 
heed those desires, okay? Now, so man has a sin nature, death by sin, and propensity towards sinning according to the body of flesh, but God has made man upright, and we've mentioned that before in prior scopes, Ecclesiastes 7.29, but God has made man upright according to the spirit of man, and by man's decision to sin defiles his soul with sin. So the body already will die because of the flesh itself. It's going to die. It, it inherits the, in, the inherent trait from Adam that all human beings, their bodies die. Okay. Now, th with the body comes a desire we call the flesh. Okay. That flesh in of itself is a desire that the flesh wants to do and it ignores God. Okay. And what we need to do with the flesh, we need to take the will, which is our spirit, and control the desires of the body of flesh. And that's, a e that's easy to understand, but hard to put into practice, as you can see from many Christian lives who are very carnal. And then the moment, now, now when a man is born, when, when, he's a, when a baby is born, the baby's flesh will die. But the, the soul of that baby is preserved because it has not committed a sin. It has no knowledge of right and wrong. The baby does it. So, so you can see that the body of flesh still is under condemnation, but the soul is not. And the spirit automatically goes back to God, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Okay? So, so here you have, but God has made man upright according to the spirit of man. So man has a spirit. When, when a baby's born, the baby has a will. As he, as the baby grows up, he ends up understanding the difference between right and wrong. And therefore, with the baby's spirit, or he wouldn't be a baby anymore, with the toddler or whatever age he comes to, which he understands the difference between right and wrong, now that human being takes his will and he can either uh, stay towards the uprightness that God has created him to be, or he can lean towards the propensity to sin. And what do most people do? What do most babies do? Or, or when babies end up getting older and understand the difference between right and wrong, what do most people end up doing? Sinning. Okay, that's why Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, The Lord hath made man upright, but he hath sought out many inventions. Look, uh, Job chapter 5 verse 8 says, You know, um, man is born unto trouble. It didn't, say man, it didn't say man was born in trouble. Let's go ahead and read that. Because I, I don't want you guys to take my word for it. Let's Job 5.8. Look at this. I'm sorry, let's go to verse 7. That's where it is. Yet man is born unto trouble. See, it didn't say man is born into trouble or man is born in this, this kind of trouble like that. Man is born unto trouble. That means every man is born and no man is created in trouble. He's born unto trouble. He, he finds himself seeking out many inventions, seeking out sin to do as God created him upright. Oh yeah, that goes against the norm of most churches, doesn't it? You know why? Because we actually are applying the verses that nobody likes to cover. They kind of skip these verses and that's very convenient. But see, people always say, well, well, brother, you skip the verses that I go to. No, I don't. I cover all, I try to cover every verse I can on the topic. That's why you always see people arguing with me on here because I cover those verses. They just don't want to believe the other verses I'm giving that contradict their verses, which, which don't really contradict the verse. It contradicts their understanding of that verse. None of the Bible contradicts. You just need to know how to reconcile the verses that seem like they contradict. And you just say, wait a minute, I've got a finite mind and I need to understand the Bible because God knows more than me and I need to submit to the Bible. And people, you know, when I say stuff like that, people ignore me. Because they don't, they don't understand until a question arises that they have. Now all of a sudden they're like, well, brother, what about this verse? I mean, why would you give me that verse? Are you trying to say that verse like, like, like excuses the verse that I'm giving? That the verse I'm giving is not inspired by God? Is that why you give me the opposite verse or opposing verse? 
Guys, when I give a verse, you've got to account for the verse I give. <laughs> but people just say, well, what about this verse? Well, okay, we'll, we'll cover that, but how are you going to account for this verse? Well, well, you just skip it. You say, well, well, we don't use those verses in our church. We stay away from those because 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 they go against our doctrine. Exactly. Your man-made doctrine does not support the Bible. And I would run away from a place like that. All right, guys. Guys, you got you got you have to give account accountability for all the verses in the Bible, not just the ones you like, not just the ones your church upholds or your your church constitution upholds, because we've always did it this way. All right, guys. So I, I went ahead and read my my statement there. Now let's go ahead and get some support for what I said. Ephesians two one, and you hath he quickened, who what, who were. Dead in trespasses and sins. So we were dead in trespasses and sins, right? Every single one of us. That body of flesh was going to die. But if we continued on in our sins that we've committed, that tainted our soul since the first time we sinned, that's right. We're dead in trespasses and sins in soul and body. Now, remember, the spirit belongs to God, okay? Now, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. See, ye walked. God didn't make you do that. God didn't create you that way. You walked. This is what you wanted to do. You walked according to the course of this world. God didn't make you do that. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. See, when you willingly do these things, guess what's working in you? The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. See, all of us had this. That's why Calvinism's not true, because all of us did this. Well, well, no, God created us, you know, the church to go to heaven. And God knew who the church was before the foundation of the world. He knew who was going to get saved. Well, what do you do about Ephesians 2, 3? It's meaningless. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh. Fulfilling. Not, not only did we have lusts of the flesh, what did we do? We fulfilled it. We fulfilled the desires of the flesh. Not only of the flesh and of the mind. So our mind, our imaginations are evil and wicked. And we're fulfilling those things. All of us. It says all of us. Look. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. So are we all sinners before God? Absolutely. Is a Calvinist a sinner before God? Absolutely. Is he a sinner even though he doesn't believe he's one? Yes. <laughs> Fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by what? Nature. See, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. So there is a sin nature, a propensity towards sin that you don't have to yield to because God created you upright. But all men wants to do is lean towards sin. That's the heart of man from his youth. It didn't say that's the heart of man from a baby. Because a baby don't know right and wrong. All right, guys, you got you guys got to. It's the Bible, guys. It's the Bible. It's not me. It's not Brother Ed. It's the Bible. Now let's go. Let's let's, let's keep supporting. I, I like to read the rest because there's a lot of uh, cool stuff in Ephesians two, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Because there's hope and you got mercy and the great love uh, that He had towards us. But we're just right now. We're just focusing on. All of us have sin in us when we were lost and when we're saved. Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. So all of us are born in sin. So there is a, a sin nature in man that he is born in sin. Okay. Now, to explain that to the, to a conclusive detail to where it'd be acceptable for the hearers on my periscope, probably is not going to happen. But we are born in sin. Now, we have a propensity towards sin, 
and sin is in the members of the flesh, and that's as far as we can go with that thing. God did not create anybody a sinner, even when you go to Psalm 51.5. Okay? So... Let, let, let's, let's, let's hold our guns, it, 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 even in, in spite of verses that are shady that we don't fully understand. But all the clear passages of Scripture that we do understand won't contradict the shady passages that we don't understand, okay? So that's why we hit all these, okay? So, now we hit Romans 7, 17. That is our premise verse. Now let's do, uh, let's do Genesis 2, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, there's a promise from God that, you know, Adam, the minute he ate from that tree, he would surely die. Not later, that very day. But something happened. And you know, you know what happened right there in Genesis uh, 3, when Adam and Eve actually ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Guess what happened? They did not die that day. And you, you know what happened? God gave them grace. He gave them grace. Now, did Adam and Eve still die? Yes. Uh, Genesis chapter 5 testifies of the age that Adam lived and then he died. But what we're talking about is, why did he not die that day? Because God has given him grace. Now, what happened when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, once they ate, you ready? They were dead in trespasses and sins. You guys get now. Now I'm gonna. I'm trying to go slow here because people always accuse me of speaking too fast, and and I'm just trying to trick you into believing what I believe. So let's just stop there. Absorb that. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the minute they ate, even though they didn't die that day, because God gave them grace. Okay, He gave them grace. He didn't kill them that day. Grace is, is, is brought right there in Genesis chapter 3 in the first sin ever committed uh, by human beings in the whole world. There is God's grace waiting right there. How about that? So God gave Adam and Eve grace. That's why they didn't die. And now, absorb this. After they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they are now dead in trespasses and sins. Okay? So, I went slow there for you so you could absorb that in. And we're still on our topic of Romans 7.17. Okay? So, let, let, let's continue on. We're going to show the progression here. Um, Genesis 3.19 is the progression. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it was thou taken for dust thou art and dust Sh th shalt thou return so Adam's made of dust and dust he shall return that's the death sentence right there the death sentence is I gave you grace to live a period of time then you're going to die and return to the ground there it is that's that's the curse the curse of death right there all right let's keep going we, we said this before, Genesis 5.5, 5, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. And look, God was true to his promise. It's just that he gave, God, he gave Adam grace and he didn't die that very day. So he did eventually die. So he still died. And it was a result of the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and their disobedience in eating from that tree. You see that? So Romans 5.12, we're going to keep going. Remember, Sin that dwelleth in us. We are born in sin. And when we die, we will die because of sin. Even if you're saved. Even if you're lost. You're going to die in the body of flesh because of sin. Okay? Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. So how did sin enter into the world? Okay? Before Adam sinned, there was no sin entered into the world. Okay? Now, what world are we talking about? We're not going to get too deep into the definition of world, but we're talking about a system. A system. 
1 John 2, 15, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but of the world. See, the world is a system. Now, can the world also include every human being that ever existed in it? Like John 3, 16 says, yes. So that's why world is a homonym. Understand what a homonym is. It's a word that's spelt the same, but has different meanings. So world could mean John 3, 16, all the human beings ever existing in all dispensations of time. And world can also mean, and I'm just giving you two definitions. We're not going to go through all of them. The second definition is a system. Okay. It's a system. It's a, it's a, it's some beliefs that are in the world and which that world upholds a system. Okay. So the pride of life, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes would be that system would be called the world. Okay, so again, I'm not, we're not going to get too deep into that. We're just trying to get an understanding of Romans 5.12 here. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, okay, and death by sin. So, how does death always come by? When any human being dies, why do they die? I don't care if you're saved. I don't care if you call yourself a saint. I don't care if you call yourself a man of God. I don't care who you are. Why do why does every human being die? Death by sin. That's why people die. And so death passed upon all men. You see that? For that all have sinned. Now, guys, true, the body of flesh will die. No matter what you do, no matter how much you obey Jesus Christ, no matter how much you obey God, no matter how much you obey the word of God, no matter how much you walk in the spirit, your body of flesh is going to die no matter what you do. You could take all the medicines in the world. You could find the new Hollywood medication that you learned on the Hollywood movie that prolongs your life. And you know what's going to happen after your life is prolonged? You're going to find that you're still going to die. It doesn't matter what, how long you want to prolong your life. You're still going to suffer the consequences of the body of flesh, which is, which is inherited from Adam, which is death. You're going to die. But I'm saved, Brother Ed. But your body of flesh is going to die. But I don't understand how come God won't just save my flesh. Because it's an inherited thing from Adam. And Romans 5.12 explains it. So death passed upon all men. Now, this death can be broad. We can be talking about a broad term or we can be talking about a specific term of death. Now, what do you mean? Death is another homonym. Are we talking about the death of the, of the soul? Or are we talking about death of the body? Which one are we talking about? Because of, the death of the soul, that would determine if I have sinned willingly fully right here and that's why it says for that all have sin you're gonna you're not gonna go to hell for adam's sin you're not gonna go to hell for that one man's sin what are you going to hell for because you've sinned so why is the body of flesh gonna die because that is what's inherited from adam okay we are gonna die because adam brought sin and death into the world and we are in adam and what does it mean to be in Adam? We're dead in trespasses and sins, including this body of flesh that's going to die even after we're saved. We are, look, our body is still in Adam. But it doesn't have to be concerning what our desires and our will, according to our spirit, will make that body do. So even though the body's still dead in trespasses and sins, we can control that body and we can make that body do righteous. We can make that body do righteousness. Okay. And that's what we mean when we go to Romans seven, the battle of the spirit versus the flesh. Okay. That's why I'm covering all these verses because now we're getting some, some, some groundwork. So when we go into Romans 7, you can't say, well, Brother Ed, you just, you just cherry picking and pulling all kinds of things out of context. No, now we can understand it with the light given us from all these other passages. Pa other passages of scriptures that are rightly divided can 
shed light on the truth you're trying to bring. And it's better when you do that than you, when you just read a verse all by itself, not knowing what the, the whole context is or what other verses say about that particular topic. Okay? So make sure you know your topic that you're talking about when you're preaching. Okay? So that's Romans 5.12. Now let's do it again in, in the progression in Romans 5.19. For as by one man. Now who's that one man? That's Adam, right? One man's disobedience. Many were made sinners. Now, you see that? That's, this is the one I like a lot because this goes against Calvinism, right? Because, um, if Calvinists say many means the elect, you know, um, like when you go to the other passages like John chapter one, as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. They say, well, that many is the elect. See, it just means certain few people, many. It's just because it didn't say all. It said many. Okay, so here's your problem. Look at Romans 5.19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So only a few elect people, only a few people were made sinners. Everybody else is righteous. Now, now if many only means a certain few, then that's, that's the logic you're going to have to apply in Romans 5.19. Well, well, no, we don't apply that there. Why? Because you're not consistent with the whole Bible. You only cherry pick the verses you want to use to prove your false doctrines. And now you see, look what many means. Many means all men. See that? All men. That's what many means. You see that? So there should be no confusion what many means. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now, what's the problem with the second half of this verse that people wrongly divide? You guys ready for this? Here we go. People say, Jesus made you righteous. So therefore, if you're acting unrighteous in this body of flesh, you're not righteous. You're going to hell. So you can lose it. That's not what the verse is saying. Look what the verse is saying. So by the the obedience of one. It didn't say by the obedience of you. It didn't say by the obedience of the church. It said by the obedience of one. Who's that one? That's Jesus Christ. So by his obedience shall many, now look, be made. It didn't say, it didn't say, so by, uh, so by the obedience of one shall many be righteous if they do righteousness. It didn't say that. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So in the eyes of God, when God looks at me after I'm saved, after I've trusted Jesus Christ, God says, you've trusted my only begotten son, Jesus, you are made righteous right now before my eyes. Even while you're sinning in that body of flesh, you are made righteous because I'm not looking at your sin right now. I'm looking at Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see that? See how that works? So guys, don't get that confused. And so many people teach this the wrong way and get everybody to doubt their salvation. Don't doubt your salvation. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, you can know that you have eternal life if you believe on the name of the Son of God. So stop doubting your salvation. Stop doubting if you're saved or not. If you, oh, I, I just committed a sin today. I need to get saved again. Stop trying to say you need to get saved again. You don't need to get saved again because all you're doing is disrespecting and trampling the Son of God underfoot every time you say you need to get saved again. There's no more sacrifice for sins. That's what Hebrews says. You can't get saved again. You're already saved. What you need to do is repent. Confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Stop walking in darkness. Stop being a saved man walking in darkness. You got to say that kind of stuff, man. People just got this whole thing confused. They got it all jumbled up. And now everybody's walking around giving all these verses that, that ain't got nothing to do with the, the salvation that only Christ can give you. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's, it's so crazy how eternal security always comes up. Well, I just don't think you can just sin and just walk around saying you're saved. Oh, you can't? So so what you do is you walk around telling everybody you're saved and that you don't sin. And as you're walking around telling everybody that you're saved and you don't sin, that's not the sin of pride, is it? 
You just didn't sin when you walking around telling everybody that you don't sin. That's pride, you know. <laughs> Guys, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. It's all hypocrisy. All right, guys, so we hit our final verse, Romans 5, 19. We prove that we have sin dwelling in us when we were lost. And that sin that dwells in us is there when we're saved. Stop walking around telling everybody that you ain't got no sin in you anymore. Right, KJV? Great verse. Great verse. That is a complete and utter cross-reference to what we're talking about. Amen. All right, guys, so let's do it. Let's head back to Romans 7.17. We hit a few of this thing on the man's sin nature. Now we have a, a better understanding of the sin. See, see right there, the sin that dwells in us. Not only in Paul, see, sin that dwells in me, but also in you, if you're saved today, and also in me, because I'm saved today. Okay, now look, look at verse 18. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh. You see that? Now what is he talking about right here? Is he talking about his spirit? Is he talking about the Holy Spirit? Is he talking about Christ that lives within him? Is he talking about his spirit or his soul? No, he's talking about his flesh. And he says, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. Now look, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. You see that? He can't perform that which is good in the body of flesh. If it was all up to the flesh, I can't do anything good. My flesh is evil. My flesh is wicked. Let's prove it. For the good that I would, I do not. You see, now what are we talking about? What's in the flesh? Now, if all we're dealing with is the flesh, this is the context we're dealing in in a saved man. Now, I'm a saved man today. I've trusted Jesus died for my sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. Now, in my flesh, if I say, let me just see my in my flesh and only appeal to my flesh. I can say what Paul is saying in Romans 7, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. There's a war going on. And you know, if I, if I only appeal to my flesh, what do I find? How to perform that which is good, I find not. It can't be according to your flesh. Stop judging your whole life based upon upon your flesh. That's the problem. That's what's going on. That's, that's what's going on right here. For the good that I, that look, for the good that I would, I do not. So I'm saying, look, I, I, I would do good, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> what about you today? Look, half of the Half of these apostolic people and these Pentecostals can't read Romans 7 because they don't agree with it. They say, well, I, well, well, you know, I'm holy. I, I, I walk very holy with the Lord. I don't sin anymore. And if I sin, I know I'm not saved. So what's going on with Paul? Paul definitely ain't saved. The, the, look, the apostle that wrote at least 12 to 13 of the New Testament epistles isn't saved. How about that? And, and you want to say you're keeping the word of God, right? Ain't that what you're saying if you're a holiness person? You're saying you keep the word of God. And what word of God are you keeping? Probably a lot of the things that Paul wrote in the New Testament epistles. But how can you trust a man that's not holy? Alright guys, see this is the kind of stuff you got to say, because people really don't got this thing figured out. They really believe that Paul is talking right here before he was saved. And that's not true. We are dealing with a war going on with the flesh and the spirit. And we're going to prove it. We're going to prove it over and over again as we read Romans 7 and 8. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Okay, guys. Are, are you guys getting this? 
You guys, you guys see that word evil there? Okay, the, in the Greek, does that say the good, which I would not, that I do? Or does it say evil? Does the Greek say good? Because sometimes people always want to correct me with this Greek stuff, man. It's, it's sickening for them to correct the word of God. It's sickening. Because which New Testament lexicon are you using? Which 120 Greek lexicons are you using that all contradict each other in the Greek? Oh, you, you just pick the best one that agrees with your false doctrine. That's what you go by. See, what I go by is the complete, inspired, preserved, objective word of God. That's what I use. And you know what I say the Greek says about evil in my Greek, the brother Ed Greek? Evil means in the King James Bible, evil. <laughs> Stop trying to change what the Bible says and go by what it says. Let the Bible correct you. Stop correcting the Bible. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. So what is Paul professing right here? That he does evil. How dare you, Brother Ed? <laughs> How dare you say Paul does evil? <laughs> is, is, is Paul still saved? Yes. But Paul's saying he professes that he's doing evil. He didn't say he, he just didn't do a few venial sins. He just didn't do a few, um, you know, sins that weren't willingful sins. No, guys, these are willingful sins. But the evil which I would not. Now, look, he's saying, I, I know about these sins that I do. <laughs> the, look, look, the evil that I do. Let me, oh, one more time, because well, people don't soak this stuff in. But the evil, which I would not, that I do. Well, yeah, you know, Brother Ed, Brother Ed, you know, I just don't like that verse. It, it just, it goes against all the other verses. Brother Ed, what about this verse? Brother Ed, what about that verse? Brother Ed, what about this verse? Hey, what about Romans 7, 19? <laughs> What about Romans 7, 19? You, guys, you got to answer that one first before we go to any other verse. <laughs> See, people always do that. And I'm like, what are you going to do with Romans 7, 19? You just skip it. And, it. and it's exactly what you do. Because it goes against uh, what you want to believe in your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked who can know it. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. Guys, if you're not going to go by the word of God and you go by your heart, it's not the word of God. No matter how much you want to label your heart the word of God. But brother Ed, I always believed it this way. Brother, my 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 pastor always taught me this way. You need to change. You need to change it. You need to repent under the mighty word of God. And let the word of God correct you like 2 Timothy 3.16 tells you to do. Okay? For the good that I would for the good, for the good that I would, see, he wants to do good. I don't do it. I don't do it. It didn't say, you know, the devil made me do it. It didn't say that the world made me do it. I, I'm not doing it. Look, but the evil which I would not, look, that I do. Look, there is no excuses here. Now, if Paul can be honest with himself, if Paul can be honest that in his flesh dwelleth no good thing, that the flesh, that the sin that dwelleth in you is there, and there's a war going on, you got to admit it's there. And if you don't admit it's there, you're lying to yourself. And that heart is deceiving you right now. You're a saved person with your heart deceiving you right now. Guys, you better agree with the Bible. You have evil that you would do. All of us, all of us would do it. The problem is, if we're only appealing to our flesh, that's the attitude that we would have. But this is, see, we're only talking about the flesh right now in the context of Romans 7. We need to understand as saved people that we have a body of flesh and that there's a war going on in our members, in our hands, in our feet in our knees, in our legs, in our brain, in our ears, in our, I mean, in our nose, what goes in our body. There's a war going on. Now look at verse 20. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it. But what? But sin that dwelleth in me. It's so easy to blame sin, right? See what Paul's doing? It, it, it's not me. 
it, it, the sin made me do it. Let me ask you a question, Paul. Did you commit the sin willingly? And the answer is all throughout Romans 7, 17, 18, and 19, he, he admits that he's doing it. And this is the heart of the flesh. The flesh wants to say, it's not me that did it. It's sin that dwells in me. Let's not have that attitude. Let's say, wait a minute. God's given me the Holy Spirit and the Spirit beareth witness, the, the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Look, when I'm walking in this body of flesh, I'm just not a walking body of flesh. I've got a spirit in this body of flesh. I got a soul in this body of flesh. And if I'm saved, and if you're saved, you got the Holy Spirit in there as well. And now you've got options to yield to the Spirit or yield to the flesh. That's what's going on in Romans 7, 20. Now let's go to 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. How is evil present with him? Because of the flesh. The flesh is still there. Trying to use the flesh's desires. Come on, the flesh has desires, does it not? Look, when you get hungry in the middle of church, you're not thinking about church anymore. You're not thinking about God anymore. You're not thinking about Jesus anymore as the, the word of God's being preached. What are you thinking about? My stomach's growling. I'm hungry. I need food. Food. I need food. <laughs> Guys. Evil is present with me. Women dress in skimpy clothes at your church. You don't want that to happen. But guess what happens? The flesh wants to look. Evil is present with me. Iniquities are there because of the body of flesh. Transgressions are there because of the body of flesh. Now here's the problem. The flesh in of itself can't do anything Unless you yield to it. Addictions? Addictions can't be addictions unless you allow them to be addictions. Evil is present with you. But you don't have to yield to the evil, do you? No, you don't. Look at verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the what? <laughs> the inward man. You know, you know what doesn't delight in the law of God? <laughs> The flesh, the flesh does not delight in the law of God. The flesh says, I don't care what the law of God says. I want to do what I want to do. I want to go to the bar. I want to go to the club. I want to fornicate. I want to do this. I want to do that. The flesh wants to take over, but you've got to put a stop to it. So what you need to do is with that inward man, you need to delight in the law of God. That's what you need to do with your inward man. But you know what, you know what's happening with a lot of people's inward man? You know, you know, you know what they do? They don't delight in the law of God. You know what they delight in? Carnality. They delight in the world. They delight in the temptations of the devil. That's what's going on there. You need to delight in the law of God after the inward man. God has given you an inward man now. It's called the new creature. The New creature. That's what God made you. A new creature. But is the old man still there? Yes. Evil is present with me. <laughs> See that? It's like a horror movie, right? Don't watch horror movies, even though I said that. It's like a horror movie. See that? Evil is present with me. No, it's not the devil. No, it's not the world. It's your flesh. It's you. All right, guys, let's keep going. <laughs> let's keep going, guys. I, this is tough preaching, guys. I tell you that. I tell you what. I had to do a lot of prayer before I preach this thing. It's it's challenging. Not, I mean, guys, if you think it's challenging for you, it's challenging for me to preach this and apply this to my life. Because I, guys, I struggle with a lot of this stuff too. So don't think that brother Ed's got it all figured out. I mean, I'm look. I'm preaching the word of God, and I need to submit to this stuff. Okay. So guys, it's it's very important. But I see another law in my members. Warring. Now, now you see, see the word warring there? See the word warring? Guys, well, when, when I got saved, Jesus brought me peace. 
When I got saved, there was peace in my life. You know, I was weak at one time. And, and, and the Bible says, there is no peace, save my God, to the wicked. I'm not wicked anymore. So I have peace with God. Romans 5, uh, uh, according to Jesus Christ. You got peace with God. I'm not saying you don't. But don't misapply the peace that we're dealing with according to the flesh versus the spirit, which there is no peace. There is no peace between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh says, I'm going to do what I want to do. The, the inward man, the spirit says, no, don't do that. We were, we once did that in the past when we were dead in trespasses and sins. I need to stop doing that. Look, I need to pull out the war tools. Ephesians chapter 6. I need to pull out the whole armor of God. Because there's a war going on. Not, guys, not just with the devil. Not just with the world. With your flesh. There's a war going on, guys. There's a war. It's World War IV. Guys, this is the most important war of your life. After you're saved. Look what it says. But I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind. See, we said this before. In my members. That's the flesh. What is the law of your mind? That's the spirit. There's a war versus the flesh versus the spirit. And bringing me into captivity to the what? The law of sin which is in my members. I'm saved. Saved by grace through faith. According to Romans 8, I have the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The, I have the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, here's the question. Is there the law of sin which is in your members? Is that still present? Yes. Romans 7, 23 declares it. And you need to bring into captivity the law of sin which is in your members. Will you do that? And we covered that cross-reference for that. Uh, if you guys want that cross-reference, it is um, 2 Corinthians 10.5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen there, KJV. Yeah, it's a, it praise the Lord. I mean, you looking at Jesus Christ all the time in your life will help with Romans 7. Romans 7 is just a declared truth about the, the nature of the saved man. Guys, we're not, we're not scotch free. We're not off the hook after we're saved. There's still a war going on. There's a war to live the victorious Christian life. And that's a war that, that we're fighting every single day. It's not an easy fight because people fall to the wayside every day. And guys, they, people think that once you're saved, that that's it. Everything's, everything's roses and boxes of chocolate. It's not. Guys, there's a war going on every day. Sin that so easily besets us can, 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 uh, make us want to go back to that carnal state of a lost and, and, and uh, of a lost mind uh, living our lives like natural men when we were lost and undone and want to go back to the old sins that we committed, not putting away youthful lusts and all those things. Guys, it's so easy to go down that road. But what's the hard thing to do? Bringing into captivity the law of sin which is in your members. What else is hard to do? 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Oh, that's a hard thing to do. And bringing into captivity every thought, every thought, not just a, a few thoughts when you come to church. I'm talking about when you leave church, when you're in the dark places, when you're in the secret places, when you're all by yourself with the door closed, when you're in the bathroom with the door closed. What's going on in there, friend? What's going on in there? Are you bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ? Come on. When, look, when you're, when you're on your phone, when you're on the internet, are you bringing every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ? Are you bringing every thought? 
You got you got to you got to bring into captivity every thought. Okay, that's important. All right, let's go back, guys. We've been on this kind of long. I told you I was going to recap this one more time, and you can see there's a lot of great practical uh, truths and applications you can bring from this. Now, if you notice my highlights, I highlighted sold under sin because that's what the bot. That's of the flesh is it's sold under sin um there's no way to get out of that all people are going to die all all flesh is going to die okay because of sin okay and then look at this one sin that dwelleth in me so we're sold under sin sin that dwells in us and then it says it again right here in romans seven twenty: sin that dwells in me that's sin that dwells in us look at verse 21 evil is present with me look these these are all truth truths of the saved individual Look at this one. Law of sin, which is in my members. You have that too. Not, not just Paul. We all say people have this. Now look at this. Oh, wretched man that I am. Now we could put our, we could put ourselves in here. Oh, wretched man that we are. <laughs> Who shall deliver us from the body of this death? No, no, no person can deliver from the body. Except God. Now, now let's let's apply this the right way, okay? Because Romans seven twenty four is a tricky one that I bumped into when people ask questions about it. Um, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, apart from the rapture to come, that's and our body is changed. It, it, we don't have that same body, okay? Our bodies are changed. Okay, so we don't have the original sinful body that's um, that, that's under that law of sin, which is in the members. Okay, our bodies are changed and conformed like unto to the one that Christ has. Okay, so that that answers that question. Okay, but as far as the question of before the rapture comes, who shall deliver you from the body of this death? Nobody, nobody. The body of flesh is going to die no matter what. You can't stop it. You can prolong your life by healthy foods and medicines and supplements, but you're going to die one day and, and you can't stop it. I told you the only thing that's going to stop that body of flesh from dying in which, you know, the body's going to be put off anyways, because your body's going to be changed to a glorified body is the rapture or, or, or let me correct that the come up hither. I'll just call it the come up hither because I know how people get all semantical on here. The Come up hither, the gathering of the saints, okay? So when that comes, the blessed hope comes, then there you have it. That's what that's what can deliver me from the body of this death, okay? So the question can be answered two ways. Now look at verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Aren't we thankful for Jesus Christ our Lord that I don't have to die with my body of flesh? My soul is saved forever. The moment I believed and trusted in him. Amen. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Okay. So now every time I yield to, with my, with my will, every time I yield to the spirit, when I yield to the word of God and the things of God, you know, I'm serving the law of God. Okay. But every time, time I yield to the flesh, I'm yielding to the law of sin. That's what that where I'm highlighting it right there. That's what we're talking about. Okay. So I can, I can yield myself either way, but what Paul is focusing on right here is showing you that you have a body of flesh to deal with every day in your life. And you can see how deadly and how wicked this body of flesh can be according to Romans 7. So what we need to do is equip ourselves. And, and I think Romans 8 is going to help us do that. Equip ourselves. Uh, now, now that we understand our foe in our body, which is our flesh, now when we get to Romans 8, we're going to see some helps and some tools that we can use to guard against the, the desires and the law of sin, which is in our members, and the, the sin that dwelleth in us, that's always warring against us. And and how we can take those things and control those things with our will, with the help of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, guys. Um, I'm trying to see if I have any more notes that I did want to cover. Um, I did. Yeah, I did want to say this. This is some pretty good stuff right here. Let me give you my list here. I've got a, a pretty neat list. 
Um, I'll go ahead and flip. You guys have been watching my uh, my screen for a while here. I'll flip the screen here so you guys can uh, just kind of listen in on this. You guys can write these down if you want these. Now, we're now if you're one of those once saved, always sa saved people, great. You're you're lined up with me. We believe in eternal security, and that's what that is. But if you're not a once saved, always saved person, you've got a problem. Let's do it. Here's the little list. Paul said, the saved member of the body of Christ. Paul, okay? The writer of at least 13 of the New Testament epistles. A Hebrew of the Hebrews who kept the law blameless. Who, who went to all the world and preached the gospel to every creature. That, that Paul, who was saved by grace, who, who was divinely inspired by the Holy Ghost to, to write down these words that we have in our Holy Bible. Here's what he says about himself. Number one, he's carnal, Romans 7, 14. Number two, he's sold under sin, Romans 7, 14. Number three, does the things he allows not, Romans 7, 15. Does what he hates, Romans 7, 15. Uh, number five, does what he would not, Romans 7, 16. Number six, Paul admits that sin dwells in him, Romans 7, 17. Number seven, Paul says that in his flesh dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7, 18. Number eight, Paul says he wills to do good, but he can't perform it, Romans 7, 18. Number nine, Paul said that good, the good that he would, he doesn't do it, Romans 7, 19. Number 10, Paul said the evil that he would not, do, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Paul said the evil that he would not do, he is actually actually doing it. Romans 7, 19. Uh, number 11, Paul admits that sin dwells in him again. Romans 7, 20. Number 12, Paul said that he would do good. Uh, I'm sorry. Paul said when he would do good, evil is present with him. Romans 7, 721. Number 13, Paul admits that he has an inward man that delights in the law of God. Romans 722. Number 14, Paul says that there is a law in his members that is warring against the law of his mind. Romans 723. Number 15, Paul said that the law of his members are bringing him into captivity to the law of sin, which is in his members. That's his body of flesh. Romans 7.23. Number 16. Paul calls himself a wretched man. Romans 7.24. Number 17. Paul asks, who shall deliver him from the body of this death? Not the, bo not, not the soul of, his, of this death. Not the spirit of this death. But the body of this death, Romans 7, 24. Number 18, Paul shows the solution that with his mind, he is to serve the law of God, but with the flesh will be under the law of sin, according to whichever one you serve as you war with the spirit versus the flesh. That's Romans 7. That's that in a nutshell, guys. Now, I did that at the end. I didn't want to do that at the beginning because I, I didn't want to give way to the practical truths we were going to cover earlier. But when you're dealing in the body of flesh, as a saved person, there's sin there. And you got to deal with that sin, friend. You can't walk around every day deceiving yourself thinking, well, I'm saved. I don't sin anymore. You're a liar. Because then Paul, Paul is not saved. Because we just read that Paul is a sinner. Look, sin dwells in him. He's doing evil. How do you, how do you account for that? Paul's a saved man doing evil. That means you can still be saved and do evil in the body of flesh. And what we need to do is know that the body of flesh is there and the body of flesh has desires. And what we need to do is take the will, which is the spirit, and yield to the things of the Holy Spirit, which is the word of God. It's practical. You can learn the word of God and yield to it. Stop trying to stick to some mystical thing out there that's going to come upon you and all of a sudden you're not going to sin anymore. That's not practical. You're going to fall on your face every single time. You're going to keep lying to yourself. And all those people that walk around saying that they don't sin anymore, they know, they, they know they're still sinning. And that just, it's just, you know, they're seared in their conscience because they're so blinded to the deceitfulness of their own sin that they're committing. They don't even see it as, as wicked or bad anymore. Guys. We all sin. What we need to do is take that knowledge that we have that, okay, I know that I sin every day. What I need to do is take preparation, Romans 6, or I'm sorry, uh, Ephesians 6, the whole armor of God, and prepare myself to battle with this body of flesh. Stop walking around saying you're a good person. Don't feel good about yourself, friend. There's nothing to feel good about. 
Jesus died for your sins. You didn't die for your own sins. Jesus died for you. And what you need to do is Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, the triunity of God has given us a word of God that we can use and abide by to battle this flesh. Let's do it. Let's use it. Let's use the tools God's given us. He's given us a Holy Spirit. He's given us our spirit. Okay? He's given us Jesus in us. God lives within us, Ephesians 4. We got the Holy Bible. We can do things that appeal to God if we want to. Notice I said want. God will not make you do anything. You, you can yield to it and yield means you want to do it or you can yield to disobedience and you can do that too. Either way, you're saved. If you've trusted Jesus Christ and believe he died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And repentance in that just means stop trusting what you're trusting in and trusting Jesus Christ. That's what repentance means. It means trust Jesus Christ. Because if you truly trusted Jesus Christ, you turned away from what you were trusting in. Because repentance just means turn from something to something. Okay? So that that's it in a nutshell, guys. Um, I went through, I, I did some notes there. Um, I might have had maybe a few more notes. I'm looking. Um, no, we covered that. Yeah, we pretty much covered it, guys. Um, um, we did it in, I think, two periscopes. Praise the Lord. Um, so, guys, just go back over the scope. I mean, you don't even got to watch my scope. Go back over Romans 7. Just read it yourself in your King James Bible. Just read it. And you'll find. And that thing will preach to you, man. You don't need brother to preach to you. Romans 7, man, that the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Look, guys, I can't cut you. The word of God does, okay? Word of God is two-edged sword, okay? You can cut yourself with it, too. So that's two-edged. So, all right, guys, thank you for joining me. I hope these, these scopes have been a blessing to you. Um, I know, you know, sometimes I leave a lot of space in between my scopes because I'm, I get busy in between. You know, they're doing the land school of the Bible here and I got to grade all their tests and stuff. So I, I don't have a whole lot of time, you know, because I'm doing the job and, you know, doing all that as well. So um, it's great when I can do a scope like this and and praise the Lord. You know, it's a blessing to be able to go back over, you know, these things that I've went over in Bible school when I learned these things. Praise the Lord. It's a blessing. And uh, it jogs my memory of all the blessed truths that we learn from that, even though they're very convicting truths, it's still a blessing to be able to know where we stand in the Lord and know how to defend ourselves against evil and sin versus being able to respond to God's righteousness and truth. And that's a blessing. All right, guys. So hopefully you take um, everything and the preaching that I've done on here in good spirits. Um, I, I, guys, when you hear me pick up my voice, it's because I'm just preaching, guys. I'm, I'm just Preaching, trying, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching with trying to preach with conviction. Um, I believe every word of God. So when you hear me lift up my voice, it's just passion. I believe every word of God, and and I truly believe it to to my soul. Um, so guys, I thank you for joining me. Um, it was a blessing. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the hearts, guys. It's such a blessing to see people even get on the scope, and even if it's, if it's just a few people. And I know there's a lot of people that do watch the replays and I don't erase any of my scopes so you can go back and you can study you know the things that I've I've brought to the table and you can study those things and you can study them for yourself that I, I promote you I encourage you to, to do that don't just believe everything I say check me out with the King James Bible okay check me out because um the Bible is going to be the final authority not not brother Ed okay the, I, I will submit to that King James Bible I'll submit to it you show me where I'm wrong I'll submit to it but, but you better make sure whenever you bring your verses, you be, they better be rightly divided because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more than ready to, to, be, to, to have an answer for a lot of those questions. I don't know everything, but I do have a lot of answers for things because I do study my Bible all the time, guys. I'm not a Mr. Know-it-all, but um, I will do my best to give you an answer if you have a question when we do a Q&A, okay? Right now, you know, I'm about to end this scope. So thank you guys for joining me. I appreciate, again, I appreciate the encouragement, the prayer. And the, the the nice emails that you guys send me and stuff, I I, I really do appreciate that. It's a blessing. Um, it, it just makes it worth it all. Especially, you know, I, it's worth it all whether somebody you know encourages or not. But um, it, it's just it means so much more because you get to actually see you know the positive you know outcome of you know other people in response to excuse me these periscopes. So um, thank you guys. 
And I, I definitely pray for you guys as well on, on the scope and pray that, you know, God will change your life according to the word of God. Um, but thank you guys for um, everything that, that you do. If you're praying for me and, and the ministries that we have here in our church, uh, what a blessing it is. Um, if you're not saved today, please believe that Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. He died for you. He loves you. He, that's why he died. He didn't have to do it. God loves every single one of us. He gave all humans intrinsic value. He, he loves us. And, and we love because, um, the love that we have for people and for things is because that character, the attribute of love comes directly from our God who is all loving. So guys, um, Trust in him. Believe on him. That's why Jesus died. He gave the ultimate act of love to us by dying for ungodly sinners like me and like you. So guys, just um, look at that gospel message. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Read it. Acts 16, 30, 30 and 31 and read those verses and learn about the love of God. Learn about what he's done for us, not what we can do for ourselves. L learn what God has done for us. Okay, trust Jesus Christ, believe on him before it's too late. Um, guys, um, again, thank you again for joining me. Thank you for joining KJV Bible Scope. My name is Brother Ed, and may the Lord richly bless you and have a great day.